And then also the idea of coalition building and effectiveness. Like, do we really need to build equality to have certain outcomes? Or, so is the end product really worth it? Or is it really the idea of what is potentially problematic about the process? So do we really need to, and I would say yes, pay attention to some of these inequalities because they lead to larger problems down the line. So by not having inequality or some uh, equity within the relationships between officers and victims, it oftentimes leads to victims being re-victimized after they leave these institutions and systems. So yes, so thank you for, for listening. I tried to keep it short so there'd be plenty of time for questions. And, uh, and thank you. Indeed, we do have uh, a, a great amount of time for questions, and so I think we'll move right into the question and answer period. Uh, if there are any questions from the audience, well, yeah, okay. Jessica. Uh, Dean, I really liked your analysis about the idea of trying to find difference and commonality and struggling with this identity, and I was reminded of a. Um, I'll paraphrase Gloria Anzal Dua when she's talking about the tensions that existed between the second and third waves of feminism. And she said that we once struggled to find differences amongst our commonalities, now we struggle to find commonalities amongst our differences. And so I'm curious if you've tried to create some correlations to other identity-based movements to kind of understand the trajectory of the GLBTQ movement as well. That's a really good, I think that that is definitely like a good future research thing because I, mean, I think there are definitely tie-ins. And mm -hmm. it's funny because I, I often think about the second, third wave feminist movement. Mm -hmm. to the, from, a, from a different research project I did, I was asking about sort of like, what is this, you know, you know the all-in sort of proposition of you know, how do you sort of negotiate difference. And, they, and I've had, had a couple of participants in my, last, in my last project where they said, you know, let's think about second, third wave um, feminism and then the challenge of INDA, Employment Non-Discrimination Act, they've been trying to pass nationally. Right. Um, and they're like, we've had, and this was like a, a, a few leaders who were at the table with the Congress trying to get this passed. And they're like, over and over and over again, we've been able to pass this for the last 10 to 15 years. But they insist, and half of the LGBT movement insists, on leaving out the transgender community. Mm -hmm. And so they had to make this, this distinction. They're like, okay, wait, do we want to wait 20 years? and have the transgender community included in INDA, or do we sort of eschew them right now, come back to them later, and then um, they, they always said that we always ended up talking about, look at what happened to the feminist movement where we... Yeah, the Lavender Brigade, you know, exactly. they had to yeah. make that choice. Exactly, so and, and, so, and, and that really, that informed their decision to say, okay, no, we're, we need to wait before we can go all in. Like, we could have had this past 10 years ago, but we need to learn from other movements. So I think there's definitely a lot of potential tie-in. I think kind of on that uh, same note, you, you brought up the tension between assimilation and equality, right? Um, and so I guess post question to you, but post question to everyone, uh, is in, in seeking equality, is the idea of assimilation necessarily innate to that? It, do we have to uh, seemingly assimilate in order to gain equality? That's a good question. That's, I think it's a, I don't know, double-edged sword is the, you know, but it's like the chicken and the egg type of proposition. But I think to an extent you've got, I think that what, what, what these people were saying in, in my case was that, you know, you, you have to to an extent, but is that, but they would come back to me and say, but is that necessarily a bad thing to, you know, and they're like, you know, it's, it's holding on to your difference in that process. I bet now it's actually thinking about that in yours too. Like, you know, when you're thinking about relationships and like, you know, does there need to be this focus on, quality between relationships, too, in order to get to your long-term goals and objectives. And I agree that I think you do focus on it. But it's, a, it's an active question of what is that balance in terms of getting the goals versus, I'm not saying it right, but I mean, and, 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 and maintaining truly equal relationships between stakeholders. Well, and your research really got me thinking about the idea of reinforcing normalcy, mm -hmm. that there was this focus on diversity, and yet <coughs> so much of it came back to that idea of you know, but we're, we're boring old people, and we're married, and we have kids, or we, we have commitments, and we have kids. Um, which, especially when you talk about identity, we do um, negotiate multiple intersections of who we are as a self and how we make sense of that. Um, and your research made me think of uh, uh, 
Lowski and Cavendish who look at institutional selves and Catholics who are also homosexual and how they um, they reconcile those two identities and how they bring them together. And you do, especially these large movements, you're bringing together a lot of interests and people can have identity intersections that may be unexpected. So having kind of an end goal at the end may be a way of you know, dealing with that diversity. Yeah, that's the way I knew it's like the, uh, all of my participants kept saying they're like, and from, from the media, from the mass comm perspective, they were like, our goal is to get the media to cover the family picnics and to stop covering the shirtless men with paint on their face and glitter and you know, like that's what they go to and that's what they know is going to sell papers but they're like let's how do we you know reinforce the images of normalcy of, of, of well and to, and to come off on that dean i was i was interested where do you see kind of popular culture's role in this first for such reasons as representations like modern family Right. Like, I mean, even Will and Grace, you know, had the tension between Sean Hayes' character and, and Will as kind of the, norm, you know, kind of yuppie normative versus more kind of blank thing. But, uh, you know, also, you know, there's the old joke of like, yes, who cares about gay marriage? Everyone should have the right to be just as miserable as the rest of us. Right. And, and but, you know, and just last week, you know, the Supreme Court case being heard, The Onion put out an article that basically said, like, the Supreme Court says we're even talking about this. Sure, why not? Let them get. Let them get here. So, this kind of popular culture representation of further and further banality, you know, of the whole issue, because the tacit assumption in all those texts is that, you know, yeah, they're normal, boring people, just right. like everybody else. So, what's the problem? But do you see? Is there a tension in the community in with regards to popular, popular culture like that? Yeah, and, and it's funny. Like in my in, in prior in prior research, I've done like people have said like with, with the Will and Grace. Do we want those stereotypes? Because I mean, even in like in, in the new normal in modern family, there's still the, teri the stereotypes are being per perpetuated. Most of the, most of most of the research I've done, people are like, we have to have it out there. We know it's stereotype, you know, and we know that this is what we hope that media audiences are becoming more and more educated, or you know, that that, that they see these as stereotypes, and so it's okay um, to do that. And with the with Will and Grace, it reminded me of a wonderful retort I heard two days ago. Some there was a more conservative senator said, well, we all know Will and Grace is the cause of gay marriage in this country. <laughs> and the retort by the, by, by the reporter said, saying Will and Grace is the cause of gay marriage is like saying MASH caused Vietnam. You know, and, <laughs> and I, I like that kind of, you know, what is that balance? You know, I guess it's like, again, the chicken and the egg. One more question to you. Um, uh, with regards to research, um, I, for 27 years lived in Maplewood, New Jersey, which I think is considered the community in the United States with the highest uh, percentage of gay family, yeah. LGBT families. Um, so it's, it seems very, all of it seems very normative to me. Um, I was struck recently when I spent some time in Pittsburgh, which is another city you might want to consider, because that gay pride festival had I was astounded by the public population of Pittsburgh that was at that festival, and particularly young families that were traditional families mixing with the gay families and I or the LBGT families. Um, I I wonder if you have focused any of your research on youth, on the children. I mean, children, children, and how they interact and interplay with um, the the. The children from, and forgive me if I'm using the wrong vernacular. It's not my, I'm not a scholar of this, but um, if they, the interacting with traditional children, and especially in their day-to-day -day lives in their schools, and how the schools are reacting to it, and so forth. If you've spent any time on that at all, I have not, and, and, and actually, that, I think that's a really appropriate question right now because all of my participants kept saying, we need to focus on youth next. We need to think about youth next. How are we going to sort of negotiate? You know. I guess I'm going to use the word integrate the cult, you know, but I mean, you know, how how are LGBT youth or youth of LGBT families assimilated? Is use the term assimilated, assimilated into the broader culture as well? And actually, it's funny that you mentioned Pittsburgh because Philadelphia they have two events, and a lot of these organizations have become these bigger centers, and they have multiple events. Philadelphia's Philadelphia has two events, and the other one's called Outfest, and it's for it's a youth coming out. Mm -hmm. event and is the largest in the world and it's 50 percent larger than their actual pride event mm -hmm. and they're like that's because we are focusing on the youth and then all the other major um cities and i, and, and, and I want to make a distinction this is purely from 
the major cities, the small cities have a completely different experience with, with this right now, but all the major cities said, how do we, or our next step is how do we engage the youth, teach not only our youth, but teach other youths, because um, a few people said, like, unlike other minorities, our history is not being taught in schools. And the state of California last year passed a bill to include LGBT history in schools to be able to teach the broader youth population. But I think that's, that's a really good project idea. Do you know, just a real quick story on this, is, um, I found really interesting, and you're talking about larger cities, so I'm from originally from Los Angeles, and um, actually my best friend lives in uh, the town that would be, it, it was the model for a grass I guess, not the, the weeds, you know, that, yeah, she lives there. And um, her daughter, fifth grade, and they had to bring in books, um, of, you know, that their family reads. Well, one of the, one of the, um, I, I think it was a little girl, brought in a book that her two fathers had written, and they wouldn't let her share that. So you know, California, <laughs> and yeah, yeah, and um, and so this created, you know, of course, an, an uproar because um, all the kids were like, "What's the problem?" You know. <laughs> And actually, the parents were the ones who then rallied and, and told the school that yes, we need to let that in and let's talk about it. So, but I found it interesting that even now, <coughs> this, this you know, in California, in Los Angeles, it was a, it was an issue. At, at, you know, at the individual level. I mean, I guess you know, the festivals, you know, have uh, uh, achieved a certain legitimacy, but yet it still remains. So. Well, and another thing that makes me, especially when we think about the justification, well, the potential justification that may come out for the decisions in the Supreme Court, the idea that children were the ones that actually had the stake and were being harmed uh, by these policies, what, and especially then with also other focus that comes on the youth, it does make me wonder if while we are also looking to, to young people who are going to be act, enacting change through their changing opinions about LBGT and normalcy in their own communities, it also makes me wonder from the other perspective, just play the devil's advocate, we also as a society tend to control children through our institutions. So it makes me wonder by focusing so much potentially in the future on the youth, how that also could create a tension between control and idea of change. So. I actually have a question, and this is going to be a good segue to talk a little bit about just like toward budgeting, because when I was listening to your talk, I thought, okay, um, I'm wondering if the idea ever came up when you were um, interviewing the constituents of Greensboro or even doing research on participatory budgeting, if it ever came up to use participatory budgeting in the school systems because thinking about education funding, the constituents, the communities served by schools are generally the ones who are left out in decision making about how the funds are spent. So could you speak a little bit about that? So they have actually done it, and I think in Brooklyn did uh, did a uh, participatory budgeting process in the school. And actually, I know I, 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 NC Student Power here in, in, in this state. I think one of their flyers is about you know we need a people's budget. I mean it's it's like begging for participatory budgeting. You know here at the state level and also at the school level, whether it's student fees, which now I think in our state anyway are um, pretty much equivalent to tuition dollars, right? And and where, you know, and certainly students are not making decisions about that. I know at our institution there's a big uproar over uh, the expansion of athletic facilities and, um, you know, at a school that's not really athletically based either, you know, so, but a lot of money, maybe like, you know, the order of an additional $400 a year for that, that, you know, Many, many of the students would say that's not what we want to do. So I think that there has been a little bit. In fact, I, and I was thinking we needed, you know, that that might be um, a, a natural uh, outreach area to get more um, interest and attention because absolutely that's sort of high. You're right, it's very high on the radar right now, people, especially as these budgets are getting cut. What should be cut? How, I mean, what, what money we have, where should it go? And I think that you're right that the students have not had a, an, an adequate say in that at all. Even thinking in the public school systems, K-12 yeah. families. Yeah. Same thing, right, K-12, exact same thing, right, you know. So, you know, I'm sure you would you would find that, that parents and students and teachers would, would, I mean, universally say, smaller class size is what we need, not more, you know, like we have, what, iPad in every third grade classroom now or something, you know, it's like the most ridiculous thing ever, sorry. Um, you know, but, you know, that is that where the money should be going? But, you know, Microsoft, you know, donates a lot. So, you know, they, you know, so there's a whole, yeah, there's a whole lot of things and that I think does, you know, in this process like these, you know, really raises the question of what, are, what do we value, what's important to us, and we need to have those conversations in order to be able to determine that. When you, 
in light of that, I mean, I remember going to, our German and music teacher were going to be cut in my school, like, when I was about 13, 14 years old, and me being the modest, you know, person I usually am, I, of course, stood up at this board meeting, in, in addition to other people, but, I mean, that was a highly contentious, charged meeting, where, with, not only people like, oh, we need to keep these programs and whatever, but also just, like, senior citizens basically saying, I don't give a damn what the money's for, I'm not paying anymore. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, as a theoretical participatory budgeting, all for it, but like how would you manage those and organize those kind of communicative spaces? Because they have the tendency, particularly with downward pressure on budgets, to get quite hostile. Mm -hmm. And you know, how do you, or how do you make an organizational form for that that kind of ameliorates or creates some process to kind of get around those hostilities for people coming in? <laughs> um, you know, I think that's a, I think that's a great question. I think that though um, one of the one of the ways around that, in particular for participatory budgeting, um, it actually you know starts with the budget that's available. So there, you know, one, it's not you know, so you don't have the we don't want to pay for it. I mean, here's money; it's being spent somewhere. It's really determining where it gets spent. So you you at some level get rid of the ones I don't want to pay. Although that is, by the way, you know, for participatory budgeting, anytime you talk about where is money going to get sent, people want to know, well, wait a minute, where are you going to get that? You're going to have to increase taxes or whatever else. And I, you know, I suppose that's a discussion that could come up. But, but nevertheless, it's taking the pot of money that does exist. Or if we, you know, so if our budgets get slashed <laughs> more, um, uh, you know, what, what are we going to do with that pot of money? But still, there will be hostilities, to be sure. However, I think what they have, what people have found, and we don't know, we don't have it in our city yet, so I don't know. But what we've seen in other cities is really actually a far more um, um, interesting dynamic that occurs. Because participatory budgeting happens every year, it's not one time, uh, if you don't get what you want, people tend to say, that's all right, I need to rebuild, get a, get a co better coalition, and come back next year with an idea, but the um, but also there have been these that we heard these stories in Chicago of this this was the story um, or New York I guess it was New York this guy came in and he had this idea a project that he wanted to put on the table the school needed you know my school needs more money um, in that one you, you could do it and for lockers and this and that and the other another person happened to come in from another part of town they had an interaction we need money we don't have um, doors on the bathroom stalls. And he said, you know what, people, take mine off the table. We don't even need to consider it. This school needs money. And I think that process of hearing each other's stories and seeing the needs that actually are, you know, the notion that our human compassion does arise. I am quite sure there will remain hostilities in this process, so it's not to, to overlook that. But I do think that the, that the group will, will gravitate toward, and they get to vote, and so more than one thing gets to happen. So there's also that, it spreads out, it's not deciding on one thing or two things. I think in um, Chicago, they came the first round with a million, just a, with just a million dollars, I and mean, they did 23 projects. So, you know, there's, you know there's, there's room for a lot of ideas to come forward. Well, and that's also a, a kind of hope and ideal that comes out of the human trafficking social movement, is this idea that as you build coalitions, you also open up a democratic space in which we can attempt to truly participate with each other and get to see other perspectives, especially as um, certain forms of technology, even our cars, um, keep us going through our towns and cities and actually not ever engaging or participating with others. Um, and so in that sense, I mean, it is kind of an ideal and a hope that that's something that it leads to, that kind of participation and what is possible out of it. Can, can I ask a, another question building on this idea of uh, coalition building? Um, uh, once again, I'm not, I'm not touting New Jersey, but we are, I'm, I'm very engaged in um, creative place making in New Jersey. Are you familiar with that um, new process? It's, it was something that was essentially, I, I'll, I'll say, put on the map by uh, Walker Lansman, uh, head of the, the immediate past chair of the NEA, National Endowment for the Arts. But, um, and, and something you may want to look into um, is a Sustainable Jersey, which is a new program, where we are actually, um, through the Arts Task Force, looking at ways to, um, to build coalitions in communities, neighborhoods, or regions, depending on the size of the area that we're looking at. 
and we're, we're giving very specific guidelines to communities in the state of New Jersey or wherever um, with regards to how to create the team. Uh, we call it a creative team, which is your, your, uh, your team that is going to focus on these action items in the community. And the team has very strict guidelines about who is required to be on it, elected official. Um, a community organizer, a member of the arts community, um, uh, you know, so it, it, what, what happens, what we have determined in our uh, first steps of uh, working with communities in this way is that when you get the deciders from the community together to uh, work through these problems from the outset, you're, you're getting, normally what happens in these communities we found is that, that there can be a little bit of a silo thing going on with regards to the whole group that's trying to move this process is all from the center of uh, school of thought and doesn't take into account the community development aspect, the economic development aspect of it, the social justice aspect of it. When you bring in these diverse groups to be your, your agency, if you will, um, it's really kind of remarkable how effective that's, that is, at least from our very beginning steps in that process. I think this was kind of the focus of the community outreach and organizing efforts was to make sure one um, participant in the interview said that he didn't want the process to be taken over by affluent um, people with spare time who would stamp out marginalized voices. And we presented to Occupy, minority groups, college students, just to make sure that everyone's voices are heard. And yeah, and the only other thing I would add to that is um, my own experiences of working with um, on different city um, um, committees that involve different constituent groups, and I was like the neighborhood representative, that, that you really, in order for those things to work, and I think it's a good <coughs> idea, but you need like three, maybe ten to one community people to elected and decision makers. Well, what because I'm they don't have the influence yeah. without no, no. that, right? But what yeah. I'm saying yeah. is your team is actually very compact. It's no more than 10 people. I know. But and I'm that's saying, hard to do. Yeah, but, but, but I'm saying if it's a compact team and you have a city leader on there and a real estate developer, because there's always a real estate developer, right. and <laughs> that you need about eight community people. Because you won't, because they what they do is their their staying power is longer. They can they can keep the meeting from two to seven and keep going because that's their job, you know. And the community people have to get back to taking care of the kids and you know to putting food on. The, so anyway, I, I think it's a great idea, and we just have to find the right balance. Yeah, right? we just find a yeah, little bit different exactly. experience. But that would, I think we can yeah. definitely look yeah. into that. That would be helpful for us. Thank you. Well, and I think what's also interesting about that idea of, of who are the stakeholders how do you build these coalitions and where do you build it from? So that is an example of a very top-down approach with specific stakeholders that have been valued. Um, what I think is also interesting, because sometimes those are difficult to build trust and, and a real interesting kind of collaboration that breaks some of those institutional ideals or ideas that people have that of group think that can kind of be created. So what I think is also interesting is for these kind of top-down organizations, to also tap into local networks that are more from the ground up and organic in the way that they have come together so that passionate people that have come together on the ground level um, that do have different perspectives and oftentimes have a built-in network of trust and, and action between them already that where you can kind of tap into that um, energy to make these actual successful projects. And I think because our process was bottomed up I would say from the period from July to January, the internal process, because it was trying to be an alternative process to top down, everything was about process and how do we go and how do we make decisions and do we have roles, someone has a role and that's a power differential. So it was very, I guess, yeah, hyper reflexive on the power issue. Yeah, it was very, yeah, hyper reflexive. <laughs> so basically the group, um, a lot of people said that it was a um, time of like inefficiency because there was so much focus on process that no one had the ability to get anything done. But when people <coughs> had roles, there was also um, related um, feelings of more um, connectedness, connectedness with the project and the group and increased like, responsibility and amount of work done. All right, I'm sure we can have this conversation. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let's go ahead and give our panelists one more round of applause.
Definitely be sure to come back here at 11.30 for our second panel, Discourses of Inequality.